I want to share with you a mystery case of a DMEX surgery performed in our office recently. This is a patient who was 90 years old who presented with chronic corneal edema in the context of an inflamed eye. And when you have such a situation, an eye that's inflamed with chronic corneal edema, which is unilateral in its presentation, you might start thinking for some usual suspects. You may think that, well, perhaps this is a viral endotheliolitis, an HSV or a VZO, or perhaps something like a UGH syndrome. But in this case, neither of those two diagnoses apply. This is what the patient looks like on the operating room table in preparation for her operation. The cornea looks pretty clear under the operating microscope, but she's got one plus corneal edema. But you can appreciate here the ciliary flush, the circumlimbal injection she has around the cornea, indicating what a hot, angry eye this is. We're starting the case here with the normal anesthetic protocol that we do, and that's a sub-tenons lidocaine injection. I'm holding a little sponge there to provide some anesthesia for the sub-tenons block. I'll make a few paracentesis here with a 15 degree blade and then a main wound using this 2.4 millimeter steel keratome directly temporally. Now here's where the case gets interesting. This is a preservative free lidocaine solution and look as I squirt inside the eye, I'm depressing the pupillary margin, look what comes out. Look at the stuff that is spurting forth from beneath the pupil. What is this material? Well, I had some indication that this could be what's going on in our preoperative evaluation. When I was seeing the patient at the slit lamp, when she was dilated, it was evident that she had a prodigious amount of summerings ring, which was wrapped around her IOL and all encasing the capsular bag. And I thought that at the time of the preoperative evaluation, this was striking for several reasons. Number one, I thought that this was the cause of the inflammatory milieu that she was manifesting preoperatively. You know, we all see summerings rings all the time in the office, and most of the time these eyes are not inflamed. But in this situation, you can see the flaky, milky debris. This is liquefied lens material. So this is almost a phacolytic glaucoma that the patient is experiencing in the year's aftermath following her cataract surgery. That was the first interesting observation. And the second interesting observation preoperatively is this bulky summerings ring material caused peripheral shallowing of her anterior chamber. And I thought that that would be a problem in terms of DMEC graft unfolding and management of the anterior chamber. So the first task before me here on the operating room table is to try to wash as much of this crap out of the eye as possible. And the reason is, is number one, I don't want to be dealing with it when I'm doing her graft unfolding. And number two, I want this inflammatory nidus out of the eye such that after the operation, I'm not going to be dealing with combating this inflammatory debris. So I spend significant effort irrigating underneath the iris and through the pupil and trying to wash all of this junk outside of the eye. This goes on for some time and it becomes apparent as this continues that not only am I washing inflammatory debris out through the pupillary aperture, but also in this patient who has got an open posterior capsule, we're starting to encounter vitreous. And so once that becomes apparent, we start doing some vitrectomy. And I was ready for this because I expected that this patient with a suspicious capsule and a weighed down capsular bag complex might involve this type situation. So here I have the vitrector and I'm using it to try to clear up some of this almost stained vitreous that appears there highlighted by these summerings ring crumbles which are waving around whitish in the vitreous plumes almost like they've been stained with triamcinolone. So I am careful and meticulous about this. Once I remove all the vitreous that I can see, I use that vitrector now, which I already have in hand, to make a far peripheral 
PI, which will be useful because I make PIs for my DMAX anyway. So way out in the corneal periphery, I make this PI and look, you'll start to see as I nibble through the iris first on top and now underneath as I slide underneath the pupil, as I make this PI, you see more Summerings ring material even back there behind the iris. So I spend a significant amount of time trying to clear up all of this vitreous debris and also to expand this iridotomy and to make sure that uh, more or less you have as stable and as healthy of an anterior chamber as you possibly can. So after this is all done quite extensively, I'll just scrub through it in the video and this is just more of a trek to me. Here's what the iridotomy looks like. I'm filling the anterior chamber with air and I'm gonna perform my decimeterexis under air. This is an air pump. It's being held by my assistant. He has a 60 cc syringe. This is a 23 gauge AC maintainer connected to that 60 cc syringe. And he's just pushing the plunger on the AC maintainer in order to keep the AC filled with air for my decimeterexis. So here we are, we're stripping the decimase membrane under air, and I'm just removing all of these remnants. And here's what the eye looks like right before I'm ready to inject the DMAC graft. So remember, this eye is semi post vitrectomy because I've just done a lim limited anterior vitrectomy. And this is an elderly patient with a cinematic vitreous. They have an open posterior capsule. You would expect this to have a hyper deep anterior chamber. You would expect a deep AC with a graft floating around in the, in the AC and trouble shallowing the chamber. That's not what you're gonna notice during this case. With this big peripheral iridotomy, what you're going to observe in this case is a shallow anterior chamber because we're going to experience here in these subsequent minutes, aqueous misdirection during the DMEC unfolding. When I inject air or BSS into the anterior chamber, it's going to tend to go posterior. And that's not only because I've done this little vitrectomy and I have this big peripheral iridotomy, but it's also because the inflammatory environment that this eye has been exposed to for so long has created anterior synechia, peripheral anterior synechia. And those anterior synechia are tethering the iris out into the corneal periphery. And so things put into the anterior chamber tend to want to track down posterior into the back of the eye. And that's what you'll observe here. I'm gonna to try to lice some of these synechia here. This is just with my long 30 gauge cannula. I'm going ar around trying to deepen the chamber a bit just by sweeping some of those synechia out. And you'll notice I'm getting bleeding as I'm cleaving some of those synechial adhesions. I have the anterior chamber go maintainer going to help clear up some of this blood and to deepen the AC when I'm doing this. But really you're not getting much deepening. Really the chamber is shallowing because so much of this fluid is going posterior and I am observing this on the operating room table now in the moment. So here we are with just a final few little bits of cleaning done and it's time now to inject the DMAC graft. So it's injected into the anterior chamber along with two air bubbles. Step one of course is to remove these bubbles from the AC. Now normally look at this scrumbled compressed flattened graft. Normally you'd really want to deepen the chamber to give this graft room to open up and unfold. However in these eyes with aqueous misdirection if you deepen the chamber or you make a attempts to deepen the chamber by injecting BSS, that fluid goes posterior and the chamber shallows. The eye becomes rock hard and the chamber shallows. So the key for doing this surgery successfully is to avoid over inflating the eye. Here I'm flipping the graft over by depressing one of the paracentesis while I inject. That allows the graft to tumble inside the eye. Now it's right side up, which I'm confirming there with the Motsuro sign. So the graft is right side up and I'm applying some shuffling bumps to sort of move the graft over in the eye. That's the Dirazomer technique where I'm using two cannulas to try to unfold one of the edges of the graft. There's still so much compression. The tissue is still not free really to open up. The chamber is shallow and yet I'm not deepening it with jets of balanced salt solution like what I would normally because in this situation with aqueous misdirection, the more fluid you inject into the AC, 
the more goes posterior and the shallower the chamber becomes paradoxically. So I'm careful and I'm taking my time and I'm meticulous to unfold the graft with taps on the corneal surface without over injecting fluid. This is a large graft. This is a nine millimeter DMEC, which I've instilled into the anterior chamber. And I like large grafts in these situations of bullous keratopathy because the large grafts convey way more cells into the eye. Now I'm gonna lift that air, lift the graft in the eye with this air bubble. And you'll notice even though I'm injecting a fairly firm amount of large air bubble in the eye, the graft, the bubble really doesn't want to go into the periphery. The bubble really doesn't make its way all the way out. And the reason it doesn't make its way all the way out is because there's so much posterior pressure in this eye, which is resisting the deepening of the anterior chamber. You see that, how I'm having to reform the anterior chamber, I'm shuffling the bubble over. That's because the air does not want to fill the anterior chamber because there's so much posterior pressure. The only reason a thin 90-year-old post-vitrectomy woman would have high posterior pressure is because of aqueous misdirection. So the key for this operation was observing, number one, the etiology of the corneal endothelial decompensation being inflammatory summerings ring material and making assiduous effort to wash that out of the eye. And number two, understanding the possibility of trouble with vitreous in the AC that would accompany problems with this lens, uh, lens diaphragm. And third, understanding the risk, the warning of problem to come of aqueous misdirection. One of the greatest chess players of all time, uh, an Indian uh, by uh, the name Vishwanathan Anand, said what makes a chess grandmaster the defining characteristic is the ability to sense danger when other people don't see a problem. And in this situation, I think sensing the danger of the impending problem from aqueous misdirection was the key. So this otherwise very complicated patient was managed under topical anesthesia in our office, in our office-based setting for DMEC. After this operation was completed, she didn't lay flat for an hour or 90 minutes. She just sat right up and went home. So I think that these complicated cases can be tackled safely and efficiently, even in the clinic, as long as you know what to expect and you've visualized what you're getting into before the case.